My name is Ed Halter, and I'm here as a juror, and I'm also doing a lecture called War Games. It's a lecture, uh, it's part of a project I've been working on for about two years, uh, investigating the history of the relationship between video gaming and the military, uh, and how that history has kind of culminated in the last two years with some rather uh, uh, interesting projects by uh, the military in connection with commercial gaming companies. Historically, not a lot of people have really analyzed it. I feel like I'm just taking one relatively small part of the uh, history of gaming and giving it a thorough analysis. What inspired me was after 9-11, uh, I live in New York, I started playing a lot of video games. Um, and I came across this one game called Conflict Desert Storm. Well, uh, I don't know if you know this game, but it's a game that came out in 2002, and you could play the Gulf War, the first Iraq War, uh, as an American or British soldier. And it just kind of um, totally intrigued me, this idea that, that someone would want to play such a recent war. And, and so realistically. So I started investigating more and more and I realized that this was part of just a, a much larger uh, kind of trend in both the commercial gaming industry and within the military for these very realistic games based on real wars. And I started to try to figure out what this actually means. It's a very lively presentation. It's not just me talking. Uh, it's kind of me in this giant screen with uh, clips from games. I have trailer, uh, game, trailers from games, uh, some news footage about different promotional things the Army has done, uh, and uh, lots of historical images. The people who should be influenced are younger artists and designers who are going into the industry uh, because they can be lured with a lot of money to produce works that have very questionable political content. Um, and I don't think this just goes for um, kind of the political content in the sense of how, whether or not it supports war or, or American policy, but uh, gender politics, uh, racial politics, those kind of things. These things are, you know, uh, as anyone who knows who plays games, they're not exactly the most progressive medium around. Um, by making people more aware of this, maybe when they make their decisions in life, they might not choose to, they may choose to do different things or maybe start their own companies with different agendas. Go back to this Sunday evening. It's coming up to 29 minutes to 10. And now the Sunday feature from Game Boy to Armageddon. War games are as old as war itself, and their use has long been advocated by military theorists and strategists, most famously the Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz in his 19th century study on war. But in recent decades, computer technology has been harnessed to take wargaming to ever new levels of sophistication and complexity, introducing the concept of virtual war. For Radio 3, Ken Hollings maps the digital history and possible futures of wargaming and simulation. As this convergence takes place, as command and control and games and simulations and representations all become part and parcel of the same thing, what does that allow us to do differently? All but war is simulation. Even on the plains of Troy, the Greeks competed with each other in games to honor their dead. They raced chariots, boxed and wrestled and boasted of their prowess with spear and discus, having no other enemy but each other for that particular moment. It only takes a few simple rules to separate a competitor from an opponent and an opponent from an enemy. The simpler, the better. This ancient idea of, of sort of champions and the formalization of war and the invocation of the gods, and partly it seems to me about it's very necessary to bring some kind of mutual order to what could otherwise become an, a complete you know, sort of annihilation or orgy of endless violence. There have to be rules, especially in war. Tom Chatfield, author of Fun, Inc., 
why games are the 21st century's most serious business. But if you don't have those rules, you literally destroy your civilization or someone else's. If you like in Darwinian terms, it doesn't work to wage a warfare of total and utter destruction. You have to have an outcome that is not annihilation, so you need rules which means you really need to start invoking ideas like games, a bit of order. You have to draw a point at which you say, right now, you know, we're going to declare a winner, we're going to have a loser, we're going to formalise this, we're going to do a bit of a ritual to bind a result, um, to symbolise something. If you don't turn something into a game, then all you have is animal behaviour, not human behaviour. War is the most serious game we have ever devised for ourselves. From the chessboard to the video game arcade, from the console to the pilotless drone, its history continues to be written. Games simulate behaviour and engage us directly with that behaviour. One man has left us a manual, however. Karl von Clausewitz, in his vast treatise on war, starts with the most basic definition of conflict, one that even the ancient Greeks would have understood. War is nothing but a duel on an extensive scale. If we could conceive as a unit the countless number of duels which make up a war, we shall do best by supposing to ourselves two wrestlers. Each strives by physical force to compel the other to submit to his will. Each endeavours to throw his adversary and thus render him incapable of further resistance. War, therefore, is an act of violence intended to compel our opponent to fulfil our will. Director of the Military Academy in Berlin until just before his death in 1831, Clausewitz was keenly aware that to understand war in the abstract as a game for two opponents was very easy, but to play that game effectively was extremely difficult. What he described as the friction and fog of war will intervene. Circumstances are often less than ideal. Intelligence is frequently incomplete. There are too many variables at play. To read Clausewitz today is to discover a comprehensive rule book for the modern war game. Wargaming expert Jim Dunnigan. Clausewitz was trying to make the point that commanders tended to drift away from reality. You know, commanders always war game. They always had in their head uh, what their situation was. And, of course, when it came to a battle, they had an image, uh, an idea in their head of what their situation was, what the enemy situation was and uh, how they could, you know, win the battle. Clausewitz was commenting upon how commanders tended to develop before the battle an unrealistic image of what was actually going on. And it's been my observation that the more successful commanders put together a more realistic and more factual and less fantasy or uh, faith-based, as it were, image of what the situation was and that enabled them to win. We see from the foregoing how much the objective nature of war makes it a calculation of probabilities. Now there is only one single element still wanting to make it a game, and that element it certainly is not without. It is chance. There is no human affair which stands so constantly and so generally in close connection with chance as war. All games, whether played against machines or human opponents, are forms of behavioural software. The more sophisticated the program, the less perceptible the separation between player and game. Kriegspiel, adapted from the rules of chess to train Prussian officers during the 19th century, became a model for the modern war game, establishing the concept of equally matched red and blue teams, planning strategies against each other with an impartial umpire monitoring the outcome. The game of chess has been around for over a thousand years and most people don't realize that chess is actually a rather accurate representation of pre-gunpowder warfare and over the centuries uh, there have been many variations on chess the Germans about 200 years ago got the idea of uh, going one step further with evolving chess into a, uh, a very realistic war game and that became the Kriegspiel based upon historical experience or field tests. Uh, it was extremely accurate, it was extremely useful. From that came all the, the modern war games and concepts. When Clausewitz spoke of war as a game, it was one in which time and chance shuffled the cards. And it was after observing professional poker players bluffing each other over their unseen cards that mathematician John von Neumann first noticed how a gambler's fortunes depended not only on his own behavior, but on that of his opponents as well. Known informally as game theory, its principles are outlined in Theory of Games and Economic Behaviour, written by von Neumann in collaboration with Princeton economist Oscar Morgenstern, and first published in 1944. 
A seminal work, it influenced the thinking of corporate executives and military planners for decades to come. I think it was really terribly significant, not so much for the contents of the book, but just for identifying the nature of what they called strategic games. Thomas Schelling, author of Cold War Handbook, The Strategy of Conflict, speaking in 1982. That is to say, situations in which two or more separate individuals collectively control the outcome, but each has his own objectives, his own values, his own information. You don't know what the best thing for you to do is until you form some reasonable expectation of what the other one is going to do. But since the same is true for the other one, it's a kind of reciprocal process of arriving at a consistent set of expectations about each other. Schelling was one of a new breed of strategic thinker. In an age of nuclear chess, he advised presidents and Pentagon generals on how to play an impossible game which had no obvious winners, such as the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Somebody said, this missile crisis proves how realistic Schelling's games were. And somebody answered, no, it just reminds us how unrealistic this Cuban crisis is. After all, how do you calculate the probability of nuclear Armageddon when it has never actually happened before? Both sides in these Brink-like situations depend on each other to back off. When the simplest game becomes so dangerous that no one dared to play it, the time had come to find a new one. But the vision of scientifically gained, technologically driven conflict was lost in the asymmetric jungle warfare of Vietnam. By the time the last helicopter had left Saigon, Kriegspiel needed to be reinvented. The American military and the Western military in general decided that the traditional Kriegspiel was no longer valid, that they could create war games using operational research techniques and these new computers to develop even better war games. But that turned out to be a false god. They could never do it. And by the 1960s, the computerized war games that they did have were basically a bad joke. They could never get them to work. Uh, nobody, everybody was afraid to admit it. Nobody was willing to tell the emperor he was butt naked. By the uh, early 70s, it was generally agreed upon. Well, this isn't working, you know, <laughs> and try something new. My father, uh, Raymond Macedonia, back in the 1970s, established the War Gaming Center for the U.S. Army War College. Dr. Michael Macedonia. It was the, really the first attempt to use computers in a major way for war gaming for the Army. Up until that point, the Army used what were basically fancy board games. Uh, he worked with Jim Dunnigan, and uh, they uh, were able to create some... Uh, new advanced war games for the army and, and brought that art back. So I was the guy they called down to the war college. I began lecturing, you know, year after year of students. But it wasn't just the war games, it was just the whole way of looking at warfare. Uh, much more pragmatic, uh, much more results oriented in terms of training. Uh, you must remember that most professional uh, military men go through their entire career without ever fighting. Uh, they're always preparing for a game they never get to play. As Kriegspiel was re-entering the military mainstream, U.S. Air Force Colonel Jack Thorpe was about to connect it up to the first computer network. You can almost approach it from an epistemology point of view, you know, the kind of a philosophy of knowledge. You know, if you think about it, a simulation, a war game, a model, those are all attempts to represent something that occurs in the real world. Seconded to DARPA, the Buck Rogers Unit for Defense Research Thinking, he saw the tremendous possibilities of the virtual over the actual in simulation and training. At that point, the simulators that we had for flight were designed by the same guys that built the actual airplane. So they tried to replicate in every possible way all the systems. The simulator ended up being just about as expensive, in some cases more expensive, than the airplane itself that it was replicating. But the pilots would use those principally for orientation, but really get skill honed and develop tactics and do my real learning and real training in the air. And some of us came along from the research side and, and we would look at the kinds of skills you needed the first hour in combat, the first day of a war. Turns out there's all kinds of things that you do the very first day that you haven't practiced for in the real airplane because it's either too dangerous, too costly, too classified. There's some systems you don't turn on 
because just by emanating the radiation from that device, maybe a new radar as an example, your opponent gets to see what it is and maybe better understand how to counter it. So some of us in the research side say, gee, well, maybe that's what we ought to use simulators for, to practice combat skills that you can't do. Even if you had unlimited gas and unlimited space, you just can't do those things. They're just too dangerous. But you know you're going to have to do it the first day of, of combat. And a lot of those things are team things. They, they require several of you doing things all at the same time. And therefore, maybe networking simulators, if we could figure out how to do that, would be a very valuable thing. If you could do that, could you allow them to stay at their home stations and still experience the chaos of hundreds of people coming together trying to orchestrate a very chaotic and disaster-prone environment? They had just completed the experiments called the ARPANET, an attempt to connect a small number of computers and have them share information. Revolutionary in the days, the late 70s. So the idea was, could we have an ARPANET of simulators, in a, in a nutshell? That, and that launched this project called Simulator Networking, or SimNet. The ability to connect things together in a, in a meaningful sort of way and exchange information that's meaningful and useful uh, has just fundamentally changed everything. It's not the, the exchange of the information that's interesting, it's what the information is and what that enables you to do differently. That's the interesting part. So for SimNet, we were exchanging information about what the different crews in their different simulators were doing. In some cases, 100 or 200 simulators, eight, 900 people all online, just doing what they do, driving things, shooting things, watching things, uh, sneaking up on things, falling back, uh, when they were getting into trouble, all of those kinds of things they normally do in the real world. But here you could do it in a virtual world. One Pentagon general predicted that the first 24 hours of Operation Desert Storm would be the most violent in the history of warfare. The operation started at dawn. By noon, the streets of Southern City are trapped northern summer. We will launch it violently. We will launch it in a way that will make it decisive so that we can get it over as quickly as possible and there's no question who won when it's over. Desert Storm was a very conventional war because, I mean, it was tank warfare, it was on uh, open plains, it was very similar to the concepts that, that people had trained for and practiced for Europe with the Soviet Union. Probably the most well-prepared for a war that, you know, that the United States has, has ever encountered. Dr. Michael Macedonia would be responsible for developing technology strategy for the U.S. Army's training and instrumentation organization, STRICOM. Their motto, all but war, is simulation. Our models and simulations failed to predict a lot of things in Desert Storm. One of the things that we failed to predict was how good we were going to be. Because we assumed uh, that uh, you know, the Iraqi military, and you have to do this in your assumptions, was as good as the U.S. soldiers were. Uh, we assumed that the Russian equipment was at least on some level of uh, capability to the United States' equipment. Uh, on both counts, we proved totally wrong. But it became a very new and different war the moment CNN reporters started broadcasting their live commentary on the bombing of Baghdad from their hotel window. Over the relatively short duration of Operation Desert Storm, a whole new range of media technologies and strategies were suddenly brought to people's attention, including rolling 24-hour news coverage, email communication, the Internet, and an explicit identification between modern warfare and the vectored screen of the video game. And keep your eye on the entrance to the storage. Again, the uh, pilot has released his bombs about two miles away. He's banking away from the target, leaving the target area lasing the target, and you'll see two bombs fly into the door of the uh, storage bunker. And heat shows up as white. War had a new visual vocabulary, and it looked like fun. You could almost get airsick watching this. And you'll be able to count each bomb. One, two. The phrase, the Nintendo War, got bandied about during the first Gulf War, and that was from live images of bombings of cities, uh, which, you know, today would look really abstracted and pixelated because they just didn't have as good technologies but the very act of it being live was what would make people make the link 
to Nintendo, or which at the time was the popular game system. Author of From Sun Tzu to Xbox, Ed Halter. I mean, the other thing that happens with games and with cinema at the same time is that Desert Storm changed the kind of visual vocabulary of war from the jungle to the desert, which is actually easier to model <laughs> because it's mostly, you know, not as many details to take care of. The first games that came out after Desert Storm that were specifically linked to real warfare were tank games, tank simulators, and they were very popular. And, you know, this is also the era that the PC gaming really takes off. So there's some early, uh, in the U.S. and Britain, there's a, a bunch of titles on PC that are based on Desert Storm that immediately come out that are tank simulators. I think there are two Desert Storms. There's the Desert Storm that actually happened, and there's the Desert Storm that was, in many ways, the first modern media war, which was geared up to look clean and technological and video game-like. And then the reality came crawling out of the woodwork in the form of Gulf War Syndrome, in the form of what mess was left behind, in the form of the people who'd been involved with it, who absolutely and categorically had not been in a game. Named after its map coordinates, the Battle of 73 Easting was the most decisive land engagement of Desert Storm. In the late afternoon of February the 26th, as an intense sandstorm raged around them, tanks from the US 2nd Armoured Cavalry Regiment took on and defeated a much larger Iraqi force. Networked data relayed to the US crews in real time during the course of the battle went on to form the basis for a digitally mapped training exercise. Professor Tim Lenoir, one of the first to map the history of what he has termed the military entertainment complex. Most of the people who were in that that unit had actually never been in in a military engagement. This was a kind of example of how training simulation in these networked environments could actually improve outcomes. It turns out that while the battle was going on, the data for it, there were most of the people in the different tanks had their own voice recorders playing and so you could ha you could you know you, you had all the chatter that was going on between the units recorded uh, also they they when they fired their weapons there were uh, wires on the weapons and so after the battle they could go back and look at who shot what and how accurate it was and things of that sort uh, there was also a satellite overhead that captured uh, you know the events all of that data was taken in, in about 18 months they built a simulation called the Battle of 73 Easting, which was then used as a sort of flagship simulator for showing people, you know, how, how you could do this. And when they replayed the simulation, they felt that, w that it was just as real as being there. It became a major sort of flagship for the simulation network and simulation efforts. The SimNet technology was the existence proof for the beginning of network gaming and the late 80s, early 90s as microprocessors became inexpensive enough, you and I could actually own one, and graphics engines allowed us to generate a pretty interesting visual world. And networks actually started to proliferate so that I could connect to you. That was the beginning of network gaming, commercial gaming. Jack Thorpe, gamers prepared to meet their doom. Doom was really made, it was made by ID Software in the early 90s, and it was the game changer in a different sense because it was the first game where you yourself could freely run around the landscape that had a feeling of sort of claustrophobic reality to it. So there'd been, there'd been games before, like Wolfenstein 3D, had you going around chasing Nazis in a castle, but Doom your head bobbed up and down when you were running which was a very little detail but it just upped the realism slightly the claustrophobia and it had a science fiction setting but the the freedom to to look and move through this world at great pace with just this this sense of, of being a person running around and being able to network you had to physically connect your computer to other computers to be able to do it with up to eight other people one word that's thrown around quite a lot in the gaming world is this idea of flow a psychological state in which someone is constantly responding to shifting stimuli and they almost become lost in the moment. Suddenly people were scared by the game, suddenly their hearts were in their mouths, their adrenaline was pumping in a way that hadn't quite been happening before. And I think something you know, clicked into the head, but actually what we've got here is not just an intense play experience, an intense exploratory, tactical, almost combat-like experience. And suddenly people started thinking, wait a second. In 1994,
the US Marine Corps Modeling and Simulation Management Office adapted a shareware copy of Doom as a fireteam training simulation. Instead of wielding fantasy weapons against monsters in a labyrinthine castle, trainees used standard issue assault rifles to shoot it out with enemy troops in a succession of foxholes and bunkers. What strikes me consistently is when you look back at history and you try to make sense of it, what just sort of happened in retrospect looks like strategy. You know, it looks terribly well thought out. But there was a confluence of factors that came together at the beginning of the 1990s that I hadn't seen before. Uh, the first thing was that ga game technology had really gotten significantly ahead of the industry that had spawned it. And the people in, in the defense realm knew that. That's James Corris. Now what kind of strategy led a film and TV producer responsible for La Femme Nikita and Escape to Atlantis to become a major player at the Institute of Creative Technologies, set up by Major Mike Macedonia as part of his Strycom remit? They felt strongly about doing something, and the something turned out to be the creation of the Institute for Creative Technologies to try to uh, combine a university research effort with people in, in Hollywood, in filmed entertainment, and in games, bring some of that pixie dust and energy and know-how and the things that just make entertainment content compelling and bring it into their products so that they could continue to capture and hold the attention of the young people who were, by this time, joining the military as volunteers. Launched in 1999 with a $45 million grant from the Army, the ICT was established at the University of Southern California. A full slate of projects green-lighted by the Pentagon include the Joint Fires and Effects Training System, the Close Air Support Training Module is enclosed by a circular rear... where soldiers can experience a virtual Iraqi combat zone. I'm Sergeant Starr. I'm a virtual character. I can do my very best to answer your questions on Army careers, a virtual recruiting officer, and urban sim for counterinsurgency training. Maybe the time has come for beating swords into plowshares and then back into swords again. But how to get the kids interested in this new military games arcade? The Army, it turned out, had a plan. Platoon, listen up. Fall into a horseshoe formation around me. What you see in front of you is the fit to win obstacle course. Before you can learn how to fight like a soldier, you have to learn how to move like a soldier. Once the exercise is started, complete each obstacle as quickly as possible. I want 110%. Released on the 4th of July, 2002, America's Army has so far cost $33 million. To put this in perspective, the wildly successful Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 cost some $200 million to develop and launch last year. Primarily conceived as a recruiting device by Colonel Casey Wardinsky, director of the U.S. Army's Office of Economic and Manpower Analysis, America's Army is free online and available to everyone to shoot at each other from the comfort of their own home. Its first teen rating was for goreless violence, now raised to blood violence. Still want to play? The recruiting office will be checking your score. I first heard about the America's Army game before it uh, was released. The whole premise of the game just attracted me. A official video game developed and produced and distributed by the US Army. That's just fascinating if you're into games. David Nieborg from the University of Amsterdam. His PhD thesis was on the political economy of the video game industry. What's authentic about the America's Army experience, if you want to call it that, is that they focus on one thing in particular, and that's fighting. And it's only man-to-man -man combat. You don't see women in the game. You don't see children. You don't see suffering. Uh, you, see, you don't see predator drones. You don't see missiles. You only see, in the far distance, this opposing forces guy uh, shooting at you, and you have to kill him. Not so much to get people to play violent games. It was much more of an interest in getting people to learn the values of the U.S. military. Before you could get cleared to play the game, uh, you had to go through basic training, and the basic training environment looked like Fort Bragg, North Carolina. <laughs> Welcome to BRM, Basic Rifle Marksmanship. First and foremost, every soldier is a rifleman, and today you will learn to become one too by qualifying with the M16A2. You have three firing positions to qualify from. Prone supported, prone... Then you became a medic or you became various types of occupation. And then you would go out and take on missions and play. But 
you know there were consequences if you didn't follow orders or if you accidentally shot the drill sergeant you got sent to the brig was that nothing happened you just sat there forever and it was boring but it was basically a recruiting tool you want some ammunition soldier okay but first you're going to have to show me how to use your weapon unsling your weapon the fascinating thing is they took a existing game and very popular game uh, counter-strike the degree in which America's army uh, differs from these mainstream shooter games that's when it starts to get interesting you always see yourself as an American soldier and through a software trick your opponent sees himself as an American soldier as well which means in practice that you never have to intentionally kill a US soldier and that's very different from a game such as Counter-Strike in which you can play as a terrorist Ready? First change the firing mode to semi-automatic Good! Now how do you clear a jam? Play to the general public also serves as a series of simulations for further combat training. Various companies would get subcontracts to develop modules like the medic module and to, do, to become a medic you had to go through basic kinds of training, you had to go listen to lectures, you had to learn how to perform CPR and various other kinds of techniques that would be used in a battle situation. So the goal was really to transmit the sort of skills that you would use in a real setting uh, in the game world. High visual attention, cooperative behavior and teamwork, you know, were kinds of behaviors that the military really wanted to develop. Roger, I see them. All the team heads up. Within the army they use it uh, literally as a technology platform. So a lot of money is spent within uh, the US military on testing weaponry and they use the game to literally test new weapons because it's way cheaper to test this new missile through sort of crowdsourcing or let a lot of soldiers simulate the impact of this new weapon or uh, come up with some innovative uh, usage than making it and then fielding it so it has become a very cheap test tool Get on. something that we, we've, we've always said and we've always had as a goal is that you would play your in-game character as if you were really in combat. In the end, the U.S. Army has become a brand, especially for uh, American adolescents. What they want to convey is a message of we are a professional fighting force. This is what we do. Feel a digital sandstorm rising? Illusion is experience accelerated. Simulation can only take place in real time. There's something in the video game's mix of disposable excess and high-end playability, otherwise known as thumb candy, that allows it to exist in a constant state of flux. After America's Army came ICT's Full Spectrum Warrior, developed both as an internal training platform and as a commercial game launched on the Microsoft Xbox. Charlie 32, this is Charlie 90. Say again. I repeat, say again. Over. It was a fascinating experience, and we had a lot of questions. Could you develop a training simulation on a commercial game console? And another thing was to ask ourselves is, is the potential of the graphics capabilities of things like uh, consoles in relationship to the technology that we were using in the military. Michael Macedonia, then head of Strycom, who spearheaded the Full Spectrum Warrior project, saw that playability links games and players to machines. It's a choice between the quick and the dead. But whose? Jim Corris. One day he addressed our group and he started talking about how concerned he was about the advent of a new generation of game consoles. And he was very concerned that they would turn into a cheap computational platform that America's competitors or its enemies would employ to train their own people and he wanted to be there first it was very important to him if anybody was going to be training using an Xbox it was going to be US forces the question then became could you actually create a meaningful training aid the feeling was and we were working at the time with the US Army Infantry Center at Fort Benning because of the kind of interface that you have on a game console usually they're what you call twitch games you know they have a couple of joysticks and a few buttons for that kind of interaction, the logical level to, to aim the development of the project at was the squad level, training squad leaders and by extension the people who composed squads. So this is
pretty much the lowest organizational unit in the U.S. Army. It's a group of nine people who, you know, have to work together and often are in combat. Charlie 32, this is Charlie 90. Say again. I repeat, say again. Over. Charlie 32, say again. Over. We're moving out. Great, just great. Thanks, sir. We head west to the Kazavak and hope there wasn't some other critical information we missed through the static. Lieutenant Phillips will set up a Kazavak at this location if we have wounded. Okay, Charlie. We're moving out. I suppose the most important thing about it is it was one of the first first-person shooting games that had the the feel to it graphically and in terms of the sort of weapons and tactics it was modeling of what you might call a elements of a real rather than a fantasy combat situation so it really tried to model the the physics and the dynamics and the sort of tactical approaches of real life situations rather than as in the sort of doom and quake games which were very much fun driven first so they were about fantasy and about leaping frantically around dungeon-like landscapes and Full Spectrum Warrior was one of the games that made this paradigm shift which has been hugely influential on the commercial video games industry towards grittiness and towards a certain kind of realism putting far more restrictions on what the player could do. These restrictions actually give a game more hooks by bringing it closer to the trickiness of reality. When you do that right you create a very intensely appealing as well as a very effective training game. Bravo team, head over there! In Full Spectrum Warrior, we made the decision not to give the player any weapons. Damn it! L learning to be good at a first person shooter is probably not good preparation for going into combat, because the goal, of course, is to be alive at the end of your shift. If you get killed in a first person shooter game, you push the spawn button or you reset and you, you start another life and you learn from that. But there's nothing to shoot in Full Spectrum Warrior. All you do is you get to make decisions. Move! And in the role of a squad leader, your decisions are typically aimed at two fire teams that comprise the squad. Uh, you're also in a limited way allowed to give direction to individual soldiers, although again, we were trying to mimic what a squad leader would actually be doing. This is Charlie 90, we have a sit rep for you, sir. Sit rep accepted, Charlie 90. You're good to go. Out. I think the fascinating thing about Full Spectrum Warrior was the concept, and I think it's been incorporated now in a number of simulations and training devices, the idea that you've got good people, you've given them good training and now what you've got to do is is you've got to make them not just good shooters but good thinkers they've got to think dynamically on their feet be prepared for the unexpected Bravo. Get going. Move. America's Army isn't the only one online Major Tom Muat spent three years running the British Army's principal land-based computer simulation system their version of Simnet it didn't always play out well in the beginning in one of the early simulations that we ran out there was a system when you shot people it was hit points so if you shot them in the hand or you shot them in the head it didn't reflect critical hits so one of the things we did to the system was change it so if you were shot in the head you were killed if you were shot in the leg you fell down uh, if you shot in the arm you dropped your weapon now that was very good but when you ran it as a sim the guys ran around shooting and then after a while they were running around and they couldn't find any bad guys but the game didn't stop because the only way the game stopped was when the enemy were all killed. So why haven't we won? Well, of course, the answer is that's because you shot someone in the leg and they're lying on the floor. So we then create a simulation where the only way to win it is to run around shooting the wounded. Now, that's not the sort of behavior we want to do. So we have to make sure that when we're talking about simulation technology and we're putting it in the training domain, that we are building behaviors that will help soldiers in real life to survive. Possible new target approaching. Target one building. Designate new target. Target five. Pilot copies. Sensor copies. As early as in the 1980s, there's this famous speech by Reagan where he talks about how a new generation of kids who are now playing video games are the future of combat because in the future we'll be fighting with similar systems. Copy, sensor confirmed. Ed Holter, author of From Sun Tzu to Xbox. I think if you think about, for example, the guys who are right now fighting a war out of Las Vegas remotely with remote-controlled aircraft in Afghanistan, that has happened, you know. Pilot MC, shade 2-2, cleared off target. 
Predator and Reaper drones use electro-optical cameras and laser designators to target their onboard Hellfire missiles, or to buddy laser weapon systems on Air Force, Navy, Army or Marine Corps platforms. These unmanned airborne vehicles are controlled by pilots based at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada using live satellite feeds which, it turns out, are vulnerable to online attack by Iraqi insurgents using a $26 piece of software available over the internet. In history we're going to see this as a turning point. We are now fighting a third war almost exclusively with unmanned systems in Pakistan and yet we don't call it a war. P.W. Singer of the Brookings Institute and author of Wired for War. We've carried out more unmanned drone strikes into Pakistan over the last year than we did with man bombers in the Kosovo War just 10 years ago. So by the numbers, we are carrying out a war, but for some reason, because we're using robots, because we're using remotely operated systems, we're not calling it a war. And so that's a good illustration of some of the questions that this raises. Entering into the arena of remote controlled warfare, of this increasingly vast field of drones, of robot soldiers, of bombs, of military vehicles that don't need people in them, there is an enormous and disturbing potential for psychological disengagement and also for psychological damage to everybody involved of a different kind of this very strange situation where someone can unleash slaughter on a family or a militant in the Middle East and then walk out of their study and into a dinner with their family. We're not fighting conventional warfare in Afghanistan. So we've got these spy in the sky flying around and doing training with that sort of technology is really only possible in a virtual environment. Watchkeeper, one of the capabilities that we're introducing, doesn't have authority from the aviation authority to fly in the UK. So the only way we can train it is using a virtual environment. So we can put into a simulation in a safe and controlled manner the judgmental training, you know, being able to differentiate between civilians and the Taliban and, and watch out for collateral damage. That and can only really be done uh, in a virtual environment. Go ahead and fire the laser. Lazing. Within range. Three, two, one, impact. Excellent job. Veterans of future wars are one thing. But how do you rewire the casualties of today's conflicts? Back at the Institute of Creative Technology, they're working on it. Now, here's your Pentagon Channel report. Military medical personnel are looking to the virtual world of video games for help in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Therapists are using a computer simulation to treat patients diagnosed with PTSD. It's called Virtual Iraq, and it takes the patient on a virtual journey downrange. Through a head-mounted system, the patient can see and hear a simulated world. Virtual Iraq is based on the video game Full Spectrum Warrior, and it's used in a treatment for PTSD known as exposure therapy, where patients are asked to recall the memories of We find people initially want to be able to shoot back at Iraqis or Iraqi insurgents and so forth but that's not allowed in this game the, or it's not really a game actually it's a misnomer to call it a game even though we're building it off of game technology this is about working through the issues that have been torturing you for months and years clinical psychologist and ICT research scientist Skip Rizzo a patient undergoing virtual reality exposure therapy typically is in a small office uh, wearing a head-mounted virtual reality display which is like a set of goggles that you put on over your eyes and one of the key features is that as you move your head or move around the graphic environment presented in those goggles updates so you get the illusion of being immersed in the environment with a rifle a mock rifle in your hand with a thumb mouse controller mounted on it so that you are on a foot patrol walking through a Middle Eastern city going through building interiors going on rooftops walking through crowded marketplaces you have Iraqi civilians that will curse at you as you go through but in terms of active dialogue at this point, that's not built into the system. And so the user or the patient is wearing the head-mounted display and is in the world. Meanwhile, the clinician has a control panel that shows the clinician what the patient is seeing with 
buttons that they can press that add in or take away stimuli. We also use a smell machine capable of delivering eight different scents. Body odor, gunpowder, diesel fuel, burning rubber, Iraqi spices, and so on. And the reason we include this is that we know that the sense of smell is intimately connected to the parts of the brain that manage memory and emotion. We also have a platform that the patient sits on. They sit on a chair on this platform that has some pretty intense subwoofers so you can feel the vibration of riding in a Humvee or the concussive force of a bomb going off. And we feel that that type of multi-sensory stimulation adds to the sense of being immersed in the virtual world. Studies are going on right now with military populations and veteran groups. Um, the, the virtual Iraq and Afghanistan scenarios are, are actually out at about 44 sites as of uh, this week. With virtual Iraq, we're back to Clausewitz's definition of war. Two men wrestling again, struggling amidst doctrines of remote conflict, drones and robots, to discover between them some human reaction to it all. But what would Clausewitz make of the digital battlefield? Jack Thorpe. I'm capturing the fog, but I'm putting it into a Petri dish, and I'm able to study it and understand it. Before we had networking, I had to write an algorithm to try to express what I thought was going to happen, what the casualties were going to be, what the win-loss ratios might be. I had to write an algorithm to express motivation of the troops. All attempts to represent something very, very complex. Now we have networks where hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, can show up regularly from the comfort of your own base and put together a very sizable combat situation and watch what happens. Now along comes along this convergence with command and control because command and control are using networks too. I now can watch all the decisions that are being made and how they're being made and who makes them. Clausewitz would have loved this stuff. Long before video games were accused of fostering violence among its young players, President Eisenhower issued a stark warning about what he termed the military-industrial complex. He saw it as an economic relationship of concern. Today, it's the consumer, not the military, who spends the most on technology. And we tend to see that technology as somehow separate from us. It isn't. As its title suggests, the military entertainment complex represents, above all, a psychological condition. One that we have perhaps been slow in confronting. A doctrine of remote combat has yet to be framed, but if you turn war into a game, don't you also change the very nature of that game? Once you enter the virtual battlefield, you may find that you can never leave it. Oh, God. <laughs> I guess the most amazing thing about the war, obviously the disparity in the casualties. Iraq, 150,000 casualties. USA, 79. <laughs> Let's go through those numbers again. Um, they're a little baffling at first glance. Iraq, 150,000. USA, 79. 79. 79. Does that mean if we had sent over 80 guys, we still would have won that fucking thing? Or what? Just one guy in a ticker tape parade. I did it. Hey. 